So welcome to our next and for today, the last presentation of today. So this presentation will be given by Lisa Kemmerer, a philosopher, activist, educator, and award-winning author of nine books. She is known internationally for her work in animal ethics, environmental justice, comparative religions, and intersectionality. Lisa recently retired from academics and founded Tapestry, Women's Institute of Integrated Justice. In her presentation today, Lisa will address the issue of people and culture. She will talk about the question, is there a line where we as activists must stop in our activism to honor cultures? So please welcome Lisa Kemmerer. All right, so this talk, People and Cultures, Animals and Liberation, is about uh, how we as activ activists adjust for the fact that our movement is expanding, it's getting a broader vision, we have a deeper sense of what activism is, and we really need to account for our relationship with other social justice causes, and we need to be aware of them and think about them. So the question on the table is, what ideas support and what ideas oppose people from dominant cultures lobbying for change in a marginalized community? Oh, the first thing to say is, I try to be conscious that animal is used incorrectly if it's used to exclude human beings. So I use animal, which means uh, animals from every species other than the species of the speaker, author, signer. So rather than using animals wrong, rather than using the dualistic options, which other, so other animals, non-human, I use animal. It's especially um, helpful when I'm writing because it's so much more succinct. Before I begin, I want to say that there is a survey that I really would appreciate people taking. Uh, I need some more people to take it for to have the optimum number for research. Um, it's going to close in a week or two weeks. The survey will stay open, but the data that I'm using for the particular study that I'm working on, uh, you need to do it hopefully in the next week. Maybe it will be open for that for the next two weeks. But anyway, it stays open as long as anyone wants to. Um, get to it, I think it will be open into the future. All right, so here's what I'm going to cover today. And I'm just going to spend uh, hopefully a short time answering, looking at the question, what ideas support and what ideas oppose people from dominant cultures lobbying for change in marginalized communities? All right, so I'm going to look at six arguments. Um, I think the first one's probably the most complex. The second one's probably the most pressing and common. I'm going to look at ideas on both sides then at the end, I'm gonna put up a slide that kind of shows what I think is a viable solution, uh, kind of alternative to um, approaches that, are, that, that, are, that seem offensive and offend people. And then um, at the end, hopefully lots of discussion. So we'll have a chance to look at any part of this and say whatever we'd like to say about it uh, together. And then I'm hopefully just turning it over to others. I don't want to choose people. I don't, I just want to relax and enjoy listening to what you all have to say. So I, I don't know how it's going to unfold, but that's what I hope for. The way the slides are set up, I will have um, first a number, uh, there's six of them, and those are the arguments uh, that animal activists are likely to make. And then in the shaded area, the response that, that might be the response that we might get. And then below that, I'll cover some thoughts or examples. All right, so the first one, and this one is not a very common one, but as an ethicist, to me, this is perhaps the most, um, I don't know, perhaps the most important of them. I would say as an animal activist, ethics are not relative. That if someone is doing something wrong, I don't really care who they are, uh, what they're doing it is my responsibility to stand up and say something. The response to that is, who's ethics? So ethics are not relative. This, As an ethicist, I can say ethics are not relative. Having studied it thoroughly, it makes no sense to say that there are no ethics. There, ethics do exist across cultures. There is no culture that says you can lie, steal, and cheat, and steal, and uh, murder one another, because you can't have a community if you do that. So there, there's definitely universal ethics. But the question is, what are those ethics and how do humans apprehend them? And there's some really clear areas, and then there's some areas that are not so clear. So that's where the who's ethics comes in. And uh, it's legitimate for people to say, well, maybe they are relative, but 
we as humans don't necessarily know what those ethics are. So as an example, I put up one for us inside the animal activist community. Vegans themselves cannot decide on many things, uh, which I think is a wonderful part of any movement. And there's some th things up there that I hear people talk about. Is it okay to use shock collars to spay neuter to um, not let your cat out? Things that we ask about whether or not it's okay to do to animals. Um, we do it to protect them, but we're still controlling them. We're making decisions for them. Is that okay? Another question that I just love that young people have brought to the table, it wasn't even an issue when, um, when I was a young activist 250 years ago. And that's because we didn't have any options. Now there actually are vegan companies, but they're worked. So now the question is, um, do you buy from non-vegan companies? Do you support vegan options or do you only support vegan companies? And finally, um, what about eating roadkill? So the idea that if, if you really don't wanna cause suffering, if it's already dead, um, what's the problem? You actually cause more suffering if you buy produce, for example, in a supermarket that's been through um, pesticides, herbicides, you know, all the petroleum and the shipping. And whereas if you just go outside and find some roadkill and eat it, you're actually doing less harm to the earth, which of course is less harm to ha habitat, which of course is what's best for animals. This is one that I was huge on when I was a young activist, that uh, lives trump cultures. And uh, the response to that, of course, is our culture is our lives. Oh boy, this is uh, this one you, you know, I think are likely to hear, and it is a, um, a contentious point. So things we might ask about this, is every aspect of culture critical or are there just some that are critical? So if you say your culture is your life, um, does that mean, I mean, does that mean that what you choose to eat is your life? Does that mean that what you choose to wear is your life? If you have marriage customs, are, is that your life? Is it the entirety? What about using computers? Can you use, you know, can you adjust to using modern technology? Can you use words from another culture without? So obviously it's a really, uh, it, it's a, it's kind of a messy region to look at. So questions come up about cultures they obviously change. There's no question they change. But, but it's just as clear that outsiders don't get to decide the changes of other cultures. The whole idea of cultural imperialism is that a dominant culture imposes their values, their beliefs, their habits onto a, a smaller culture. Um, so some foreign or some outsider that's dominant and powerful tries to affect the culture. That's cultural imperialism. And it's kind of the core of, of what this discussion works around. So some examples are, um, what is beauty? So some may, may bind feet, some may think that youth is more beautiful than age. Some may expect women to wear makeup, to wear high heeled shoes, to wear corsets, to, uh, to do things that are actually physically harmful. And uh, those may be the cultural mores for beauty. And what is, can someone outside comment on that? Um, can, what, what is the role of someone who's interested in ethics with regard to these, I would say, sexist cultural mores. Sex relations is another example, and of course, diet, one that we're familiar with. The idea too is that human life trumps um, protections for cultures, but the question is, does it really? So if we're protecting cultures to protect lives because human beings are preeminent, um, or even just because life is preeminent, then why is my culture such a gun culture and uh, how do we change that? What about war? What about our warmongering in the United States or the fact that we somehow among advanced, uh, I shouldn't say advanced, sorry. We among uh, Western industrialized cultures, sorry, that's where you see my being 120 years old. Uh, we as industrialized uh, countries, we still have capital punishment, but you know, Europe, every other country has pretty well figured out that it is um, part of that same group that capital punishment is not a good idea. We haven't figured that out. So how, what's the right way to bring change? But clearly um, it, we can't say that human beings, the life of humans always trumps something else because clearly it doesn't. And nowhere is this more clear than when a culture has the habit of eating other people. <clears throat> Suddenly we find that uh, it is okay for someone to come in from the outside and suggest that maybe you should eat something else. Examples of this, Macaw whaling, again, this is really close to home right here in Washington State uh, where I grew up. 
the idea that any Molactivist would say that every life matters. And, uh, but somebody else might say, look, Macaw decided to come back to this hundred year old tradition and they killed one whale. Look at what your culture's done to the oceans. How many, uh, how many other sea lives, how many trillions of sea lives have been killed in the fishing industry? And why do you show up with your signs um, in our culture to tell us that this one whale is problematic? You know, go back to your own culture and do the work you need to do. And another example that is much more common and from the, I think, uh, internationally known is the one with dog meat. Um, and again, whatever culture you're from, there's your, your, your pet, your pet uh, animals that you don't eat. And it is a very cultural matter. And just because uh, cultures like mine see dogs as in that category, does not, certainly does not entitle us to feel like somehow that's more important than pigs or chickens or uh, cattle. So the argument here, the common one from animal activists and ones that, uh, one that I would spout off without a thought uh, 20 or 30 years ago, lives trump cultures. Um, it, is, it is still a, a slippery territory um, because cultures are lives. Because um, anytime you step into someone else's culture and try to tell them what to do, there are always problems in your own culture that you can look at first. So again, animal activists are likely to say that we need to defend the defenseless against any oppressors. And this is kind of a subset of the one previous. And the response might be that activists are the oppressor. And here is where I just ask that we think about intersectional uh, integrated justice. The idea that it, we, every, every activist community tends to think that their it, their issue is the most important, most pressing issue, whatever it is. And you can make strong arguments about like climate change, obviously, population problems, obviously, hunger and starvation, obviously, animal activism, yes, of course. But the point is they're all connected. And once you understand that it's a system behind it, it's a system of oppression that's creating the problem, you recognize that it, it will do you no good to somehow think that you're going to defend against the oppressors and, and, and thereby you become an oppressor, you're perpetuating that core idea and that core problem, and you will never liberate animals while you are oppressing others. Animal activists might say to uh, someone in a marginalized community, your culture endangers humanity, i.e. therefore I'm entitled to come over here and try to change things or to insert my voice. But of course, again, and this comes back to the response given uh, earlier, so does yours would be, any reasonable person could say, so does yours. Um, so recently with COVID, zoomorphic diseases have come under fire. Fantastic, wonderful, so glad that they have. Um, but let us not forget extinctions and climate change. These are absolutely huge uh, humanitarian concerns, earth concerns, um, concerns if you care about animals. Uh, that are caused squarely by um, the dominant activists and the dominant culture. And again, you know, looking to our, being humble and recognizing our own flaws and focusing on our own flaws first. And this one, I don't know if you're too uh, uh, likely to hear, but it's one I think about sometimes that what is culture and why should it matter? Cultures change, of course they change. Isn't this kind of an, an arbitrary construct to be looking at? And of course the reply is, well, so is family, and so is the individual. I mean, they're just words and humans trying to understand words and language. But at the end of the day, they do mean something to, mean something to individuals that use the language. And I think that we can't, um, that we can't ignore what these meanings have to the people, to people inside marginalized communities, in particular because they are marginalized communities um, uh, affected by dominant cultures around them and kind of constantly under that pressure and threat of larger and more dominant cultures. Um, and, and again, you can always quibble about what something means, but in arguing and talking and discussing ideas genuinely, I think you don't, you don't spin down to you can't define the word and therefore you can't argue that it's sacred or needs to be protected because frankly, that's true of almost any word. For example, if you tried to define chair clearly and cleanly, you can't do it. There's beanbag chairs, there's spinning chairs, there are roller chairs, you can sit on a stump, is that a chair? So defining words is complicated. 
but it shouldn't prevent us from um, communicating, especially that important ideas where, where definitions become even more difficult. Yeah. Um, finally, we have to be very careful, I think, not to digress into mudslinging on these topics. So, and, and I, I hear it fairly often. Ah, oh, they're just so selfish and narrow and cruel. They think they're more important than a whale or a dog or a fill it in yourself. Well, and so is anyone who thinks they can walk into someone else's community and they think they feel so sure of themselves and they're so unreflective as to not turn a lens inward and realize, oh, there's plenty to criticize all the way around. So being careful always to be humble and recognizing our own culture, our own foibles as human beings and as cultures, and again, the interconnected nature of oppressions and that you cannot mistreat others and think you're going to solve the mistreatment of animals. All right, possible preferred approach. I really debated whether I wanted to do this or just go to discussion, but maybe it will also be a point of discussion, so I'll throw it out there. And I see even though I was warned not to put it on the right side of the screen, I have been careless. So hopefully you can get the gist of what uh, the points are. My conclusion from having blundered through this topic over the course of, I don't know, it must be three, five, four years now, um, that there's a lot of new nuance to it, but at first I completely failed to see. And I'm quite sure there's a lot more nuance that I'm failing to see. So my approach is stay in my own community. Now, if I want to address, if I feel strongly I can't bear to stand out while, let's say, we go back to the macaw, while a whale is being killed on the coast, um, just, I don't know, 60 miles from me, um, then, then what do I do, right? First of all, I have to acknowledge there's an awfully lot of issues that I could take on that are in my own culture. But if I'm going to still, I want to do something then I need to first be informed. I need to be informed in this case of the macaw culture, of the indigenous cultures, of oppression, of the issues that the macaw bring to the table, of what their concerns are. I need to be versed on those. And um, I need to be uh, honest and, and say to them, I need to, give, I need to not just know those, but I need to be deep enough in my compassion and my activism to show that these matter to me, that I'm not just there to try to look like I care because I wanna help the whales. If you're not sincere in a deeper caring, then I strongly suggest you just stay in your own community. And I understand that, I understand that. There's a lot of passion around animal activism, but you will only do damage if you go into another community without um, understanding other social justice issues and compassion that is bigger, that is larger and more encompassing and a recognition of the, uh, the, the interconnected oppressions. I think you have to be humble. I think you need to be aware of, not just aware of them, but own them and own your part in them. And then I think when you go to those communities, you share ideas. You don't show up with the idea that you're gonna change them. You show up with the idea that, gosh, this really worries me. Um, are you willing to hear what I have to say and you only do that after you have been very clear that you have heard what they have had to say, that you have first listened to their concerns, that you are uh, aware of their sense of marginalization and aware of why, which what, what you are doing can be offensive and how best to avoid that. And then what I would say, okay, see, I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go into the community. I'm saying, if you do that, please do these things. What I say is work in your own community and then support activists in the marginalized community. So if you look at the macaw, they have activists who are against the, the whaling. Any issue that's out there for animals, as far as I know, there are activists inside those communities and that's what you do. You say, what can I do? If they want you to give them a microphone, if they want you to give them a blog, if they want you to uh, send money, those are the things you can do. Write an article about the subject. So be a support for the activists that are inside the community. I can't say enough. That is what I think is the best answer here. I work in your own community and support activists in other communities if you feel that passion, uh, which you should, right? Those issues do matter. All right, I wanted to put one book on the table. 
Dangerous Crossings by Claire Jean Kim. If you want to read a book that will just spark all sorts of thoughts on this, I think this book is a good one. Please don't forget to take the survey and please, it takes about 20 minutes, try to get it done. Um, in the next week, if you could, it would be greatly appreciated. Now here, I will open it up to discussion and the ideas, the, the six points are on the table there so we can look at them. And now, thank you. Thank you to those who have organized that have made this web work and I hand it over to others. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so for everyone watching right now, we are at the Q&A part pretty much. Um, but this is going to be slightly different because um, we want to have, or Lisa asked us, you know, if we could change it to a discussion. Let us make sure we are always uh, loving in our approach. That please, any thoughts you have, please put them on the table and be feel free to play with ideas. Don't, don't worry about whether or not you stand behind that idea. Put it out there and let's all uh, embrace these ideas uh, along with each other. Um, as, as vegans, as animal activists, as people who care, let us be compassionate, please. Yeah, that's wonderful. So in, in the meantime, um, would you maybe like to elaborate more about the current slide you have on here right now. Um, do you want to say anything more about this or to give people a better idea what they can talk about or you just want to leave this on here and stir that thought. people come to their own conclusions and questions or comments? I guess while I have a minute, I'll say um, I hope people will come and work with me through Tapestry. And if you will mm -hmm. go to my website there, you can learn what it is. It hasn't been formed yet, it's new. So um, the sky's the limit, propose things. And I mean, taking an idea like this and having a, a get together to talk about it, whether, whether to form a paper, whether just to grow more ourselves, mm -hmm. um, those are the kinds of interactions I'm looking for. The kind of stuff we get to do through this wonderful conference, um, making it more possible more often. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. Anyone out there want to argue that ethics are relative? So let's hear it. Okay, I see one. Silvio. Okay, you can wait. It's such a common view. I remember at a conference once saying, somebody said to me, why are you talking about indigenous cultures when your own culture does something? I said, I will go after anyone. Who, um, who harms animals. And, yeah. and I mean, that was just my youth, my passion and my lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, let's put it all on the table. I've walked every bad path there is out there and, <laughs> and I can't even say they're bad. It's part of growing up. It's part of having a broader vision. And every, we need every path. It's all yeah. good. All right, so you have, we have one person. Um... Silvio, you are unmuted now, so feel free to post a question or add a comment. Uh, great. Um, so yeah, first, first I'll, I'll just put out there that um, that my view on this particular question is that um, from an ethical standpoint, I mean, to to me, it seems fairly clear that from an ethical standpoint right is right and wrong is wrong, regardless of culture. Um, from a strategic standpoint, that's where I, I feel there's really a question. Um, it, it does seem very difficult for someone from a, from a dominant community to tell people from a community that feels threatened by your community what to do and not have it backfire. Um, but I am, interested in, in why you posed that particular frame. Do you, do you think the, the way this, do, do you see related arguments playing out for people um, addressing other communities that are not um, so um, unambiguously marginalized by their own community, but are not their own community? Can you repeat from the do you please? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you see? Do you see? Um, do these kinds of arguments also come up um, when 
you have people speaking to another community that is not so clearly being oppressed by their own community. Like, like uh, someone from a marginalized community telling someone from a dominant community um, yeah. to change about their culture or no. from two different communities that are not I understand. So um, Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I didn't get it. I think I do now. So you're asking, what about the other way around, right? About the other way around or, or with two communities where one is not clearly oppressing the other. So, all right, so two completely, I'd say those are two very different scenarios. So two communities where they're not oppressing each other, um, I would say, um, oh good, I hope this stirs discussion. I would say all, I'd have to go back and look at them, is my sense that all of these will still apply, but they will be less weighty. That I think what makes this prob especially problematic is the dominant, is the oppressiveness of the dominant culture and the mouthiness and the arrogance that, that I have had. And I, and I know where that comes from and I know what it does now. And that's what I didn't get when I was younger. Um, so, you know, I think that if, if two cultures are equal, I don't know how you'd ever have two equal cultures, but if you did, I still think I still think the best thing to do is support those who want to bring change inside that other culture if you feel moved to do so, rather than try to move within that culture or try to bring change as an, as an outsider. All right, so that's the one question. The other is the marginalized coming into the dominant. Um, marginalized person, I think that's important. I, I think that to some extent, one of the problems of the dominant culture is that we are clueless about marginalized cultures, about their experiences, about what the dominant culture does. So I think that it's actually beneficial if people from marginalized cultures uh, try, to, try to bring change, but I just feel, I feel like I can't even say that. It's our, we need to fix our own problems. We are the problem, we need to fix it. However, if somebody from a marginalized community does want to come and try to bring change, um, bless them and thank you for that. Um, and that is a wonderful thing because a lot of our problem is ignorance and we need to hear those voices. Silvio, is that a reasonable enough answer? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, um, that helps. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so Lisa, there was a question coming in in the Q&A part because uh, the microphone wasn't working for someone. Uh, I, would, I will just read out the question for you. So it starts with, thanks, Lisa, for the talk. We just working with a background of a dominant culture. Do you think it is important to... Bianca, hear... will you yeah. please read really slowly so that my brain is able yes, to... Yes, of course. Thank Sorry. You. <laughs> thank you. It's okay. Thank you. Of course. Okay. We are just working with a background of a dominant culture. Do you think it is important to deal with our own history as the animal movement? There is another question, um, but maybe you want to answer this one first. Yes, um, yes, of course it is. And uh, I, um, it's hard because I wish you had a microphone. I would like to know exactly why you're asking that, like what aspects of our culture, like for example, and I own it, the things that I did and I need to deal with that. And I, uh, yes, we need to look back on what this movement has done that has, that has burned bridges, that has harmed others, that has harmed social justice, that has harmed our own cause by harming other causes and by harming people in, that, are, that are animal activists right alongside, uh, right part of the movement. So yes, we need to look at our history, our movement. We need to do so much self-reflection. Now, I wanna say, as I say that, I'm in the United States and I can't imagine a more messed up movement than the one we have right here in the United States. So I'm not as familiar with movements elsewhere. Um, so in saying that, I'm guessing it's the case. I'm guessing it's the case. I've met enough people from enough other cultures 
that there is, for example, sexism in particular is the one I'm most aware of in other countries. So the answer is, yes, we need to look at our history. Yes, we need to uh, make reparations, make corrections. And I don't, I don't know how well we can move forward without doing that. Um, I think it's, it's one of the initial steps. I think for me, looking back and remembering these times when I did these things, and I'm just like, I am mystified by my own single-minded ignorance. But I think that it's, but I also think it's natural enough, you know, at some point you're 20 and how much have you read? And especially me, I don't, I have a reading disability, so I don't read a lot. So I'm always more ignorant, I think, than pretty much everybody else around me. It's my sense of it. But, you know, um, yeah, we have to own it, look at it uh, in order to change it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the other part of the question is, do you think this could be a part of decolonizing the mindset of people in a dominant culture in the animal movements? I think it's essential. It's essential to decolonizing the mindset of people in the animal um, activist community. And it's just, you know, it's, I'm, I'm working right now on a book on sexism in the movement. And I just despair at how ignorant, how we are just so retro. And I, and again, I want to say that I want to be very clear. I speak largely for my own country and its community of animal activists. I know that it's also in other places, but I know that in this country, we are, we're in, we're in crisis because we have been so unreflective because we have been so single-minded, anything for the animals, that we have hurt one another, we've burned bridges with other communities. Um, we have made, we have shown the world just how idiotic activists can be. And it's time to change that, yes. Okay, um, all right. Uh, there are like two more questions. I think the mic isn't working for some people. So I will read them for you and once again, I would, encourage everyone if your mic is working or if you have a strong internet connection um, feel free to raise your hand and i will unmute you and you can talk to lisa directly um, so the next question um, starts about the issue of buying from non-vegan companies we are seeing people being very aggressive on the inter internet you know mm -hmm. an example vegans against mm -hmm. vegans Sometimes it is difficult to discuss the subject because people become very emotional. Do you think it is positive to discuss that openly on social networks or should it be only discussed inside vegan groups? I don't think it matters where it's discussed if we do it with compassion. And mm -hmm. I think that the emotions aren't the problem. It's the types of emotions. It's the fact that we're nasty and sniping and biting and rude and, and unfeeling and unthinking in how we deal with topics. And if we could change that, obviously it wouldn't matter where we discuss these. And, and obviously that would be best because isn't it best to put these things right out there where the whole world can see these discussions? But if we're acting like a bunch of... I don't know. Yeah, I despair of even an example, right? Because I never disparage animals and I don't want to disparage human beings. And, and this behavior is just, it's appalling. Mm -hmm. So we have to soul search as to who we are and, and how we're going to deal with these kinds of conflicts and controversies. If we can't, if we can't move from a point of compassion, then who are we? That's true. <laughs> Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, I will if read you have a mic, please come back if you have more. If I haven't answered it, I'm sorry, those of you who don't. And I wish so much we could have a discussion, but I know this group's going to figure out a way for us to do that yeah. next year. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, okay, so another question um, starts with like an introduction again. So if marginalized communities harmed other humans instead of other animals, would it be morally acceptable to not intervene? And if we make a difference between both cases because of the species of the victims, 
Could it be considered a spe speciesist behavior? Yes. And that's where, which one was it under? Um, whose ethics comes in, um, activists are the oppressors, defend the defenseless. And this is a point of view, this one that you're expressing is certainly one that I have taken up many times is that, oh, sure, if they're cannibals, we're gonna march right in and tell them they can't do it. But if all they're doing is eating pigs, okay. But the problem here, you have to back it up a little bit. The problem isn't that we'll march in to change things for humans and not for animals. I see the real problem here is the fact that we're marching anywhere when we got so many problems with what we're eating right in our own communities. So the question is, given all the complications of being part of the dominant culture, now if you're not part of the dominant culture, I think I'm, I'm not speaking um, on that point. As I say, I think you're welcome to step right in and, and please be heard. Um, but if you're part of the dominant culture, um, why on earth are you, I, I, I point to myself, I look back 30 years ago when I marched up there and held a sign at the macaw and I was so busy protesting the fact they were gonna kill one whale and nobody ever pointed out to me. I come from a culture that has destroyed the seas. The ecosystems are wrecked. The, the so-called fisheries have collapsed and I'm up there complaining because they're killing one whale. Now, I'll grant you, I don't want that one whale to be killed. It's not morally, I'm very clear it's wrong. But it's just as wrong for me to be so worried uh, about what another community is doing when my own community, you multiply it by a million times if you want to see problems and damage to animals. So again, if you look at the weight of, of, of who is really harming animals, it's the dominant culture. Um, and if you look at the harms caused by activists, um, trying to insert themselves as great authorities into regarding how others should live uh, and what that's done, how that makes our movement look, especially given that most of us, especially in my era when I was young, we paid no attention to any other social justice cause. Now, some did. Some were very well informed, but the vast majority of the movement was, you know, it's like anything for the animals and, and that was really all that, that mattered. And those days are gone. We are beyond that. We are smarter than that now. We're more informed than that. We are more informed than that. So no, it is not right. If you are eating other people, whether the people be a pig or a human being, it is not okay. But when my own culture is doing so many things that are not okay, why am I showing up in some other community to complain about what they're doing? Mm, yeah. That's true. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I just saw another question come in. Um, once again, also feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can talk to Lisa. So the next question is, can't you fight for animal rights in both your own culture and other cultures, preferably side by side with vegans from said community? Say it again, please. Can't you fight for animal rights in both your own culture and other cultures? Mm -hmm. um, and then it also says, preferably, preferably be, I cannot pronounce this, sorry. Preferably, preferably be, your eye yes. upon you. Thank you. <laughs> side by side with vegans from said community. Side by side. Mm. I would inquire if that is what they prefer. It is my experience that when you have someone from the dominant culture standing there, it actually hurts that other, it hurts their cause in their own community. Oh, okay. So yes, you can, but again, um, remember, work in your own community first and support others in other communities. And if they want you to stand with them, mm -hmm. um, let them be the judges on that. But again, my experience is it's not such a good idea. We don't have a very good name. Um, pretty much anywhere for a very good reason. Mm. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to check if there are any more questions. We can wait a few minutes. We still have some time. So if anyone wants to ask an additional question, I see someone raising your hand. I will unmute you. And if anyone wants to respond to the questions that have been on the table, that would be fantastic too. Let it rip. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I, I teach on Zoom, so I'm used to all the technical difficulties and things like that. Okay. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, uh, Lisa, first of all, thank you so much for the thought-provoking um, presentation. It was fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, thank you so much for all the presentations, if, if you guys are listening. Uh, I was just wondering, do you see uh, um, some grounds for optimism or improved prospects for kinds of global or cross-cultural or uh, uh, collaborative forms of solidarity across communities? Um, if you see things improving from, from the time you talked about, you know, the, the anecdote with the whale and so on. Yes. I absolutely do. Young people are so far ahead of anything. You, you all, you youngins are amazing. The way you're dealing with binaries and sexism and the way you're integrated with racism um, and just, you are just on top of things. You have so much information coming in through the internet that you don't live in isolation like I did when I was young you're bombarded with the larger world and you really have a chance to get a hold of it and get a bigger picture. And to some extent you can't get away with having a really narrow view. Somebody's gonna zap you, which is great. <laughs> so the answer is yes. I have huge yeah. hope from just watching y'all, how you're growing and changing and, and dragging me along. And I'm like, whoa, look at that. I mean, this whole idea that should you buy from a company that isn't fully vegan. I remember when I first bumped into them, I'm like, is that even a thing? And the answer is yes, it is. Young people are, are pushing the limits. Fantastic, you go, you, absolutely. Okay. So does that answer your question, Erin? Do you have anything to add? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Yes, it does. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for your question, Erin. Uh, I did see another person raise their hands earlier. Um, yeah, it was, if that person wants to raise their hand again, I will, here you go. Um, okay. Uh, hi, Lisa, thank you for your wonderful talk. As always, it's a pleasure to listen to you. I don't know if my, uh, my question makes a lot of sense, but uh, what if, um, um, uh, how do I say this? Um, what if, uh, if I'm an expert, let's say for whaling and my dominant, I'm part of the dominant community, um, but I'm an expert on, on some thing a marginalized community does. Like what if that, there's a conflict? Oh, this is a great question. These are all great questions. Um, yeah. So the question is here. The question is how do you nuance that, right? All right, so great, you have this, this knowledge, but you don't just march in there and tell them you know all sorts of things because that's clearly not gonna work. So it seems to me that if you have all sorts of knowledge, you are first gonna hopefully know that you don't do that. Because if you don't know that, your knowledge has already come under question. It's a, it's, it, there's a hole in the knowledge. So presumably the knowledge comes with the understanding that as somebody from a dominant culture, uh, this needs to be handled with kid gloves. And I think I would say the same thing. I would say, if you have a burning urge to take your knowledge, I mean, to me, the number one place to, to give that is to the dominant community. Hey, look here, you know, here's how we can use this or understand it. But if you have a burning urge, because it has most, most personally to do with uh, a marginalized community, Oh, there's two things I'd be careful of. One is studying a culture you're not part of is, what's the word? Problematic? Um, um, it's, it's um, I don't know, as a woman, I sure don't want, uh, I sure don't like it when, when men give me their studies about women and who they are just as an example. Mm -hmm. um, I know myself internally in ways no scholar is ever going to understand my world. And of course, that's true of every individual. And that doesn't discount the fact that we need scholarship and we need to study 
whatever it is where we have a passion to study. But we have to recognize that as outsiders when we're studying another culture or another people, it's limited. So that's the first thing. There's only so much you're going to understand as an outsider. And the second thing is, if you really have a burning urge to help, I go back to the suggestions. Then you work with people inside the community and they'll tell you straight away how far off, you know, I say they'll tell you straight away. That's our culture that says everything straight away and straight up and direct. If you're paying attention and if you know the culture, you will hopefully be able to ascertain just how far off the mark your information may or may not be from their point of view, from inside the culture, what the value is of your knowledge. Now, if it's valuable and you are working with, say, activists who you have, you know, you've asked them if you can work with them and they are willing to work with you and interested and they then 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 you carry on in that way. You work with them, you support them, you give them the information and you let them run with it. So you get out of the way. If you truly have something good in your scholarship to offer and someone's interested in that and invites you to share it and you come in as someone sensitive to that community, aware of that community in a larger sense and, and then offer what you know and they want it, fantastic. Thank you very much, perfect answer. Okay, thank you. Um, Cecilio? You have another question. And there's also another question in the Q&A that I will read out afterwards. So Silvio, you, you can post your or ask your question. All right. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the what if it was humans question a few questions ago, since that relates to the first question I asked. Um, just to, to point out some historical examples, um, slavery in both the British colonies and in the United States ended partly through coercion by other white people who didn't own slaves. Uh, my impression is that the British colonies were certainly marginalized relative, like the white people in the British colonies were certainly marginalized relative to white people in England. Um, and in the United States, I don't know if you could say the South was marginalized relative to the North, but it certainly wasn't the other way around. Um, and it seems to me that someone who's committed to the people and cultures side of, of your table would be committed to saying that neither of those was okay. Um, and I'm sure there are other analogous examples um, from history that, that we could think of um, eventually. But, so you're pointing out the power and importance of, um, of, of internal, inside a culture critiquing. Uh, well, if you, if you count England and the colonies as one culture, if you count white people in England and white people in the English colonies as one culture, and if you count white people in the northern parts of the US and white people in the south as one culture, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think those would have been uncontested definitions if you told those people at the time that they were one culture. Yes, that, that's the, the point there of culture is an arbitrary category and what does it mean, right? That hits at that. and how we define it. Okay, so um, I will read out another question that was posted in the Q&A feature. Uh, it says, Lisa talked about the questions on the table. Can you please repeat them? You mean these six points? Is that the question? Um, possibly. That's it, it. Just says repeat the when you talked about the questions on the table. So, um, if that person could elaborate some more, um, maybe we can come back to that. Ah, okay, she just said, uh, you said that she, you, you put some questions on the table or she put some questions on the table. 
Um, I'm not sure what she is referring to, but. Uh, do you know? Hmm? I, I couldn't hear you. Okay. Well, maybe, um, do, do you mean the six questions? Is that what you were referring to, to the person who posted the question? You can just type in a yes or a no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, she said, sorry, maybe I lost the question. So um, maybe we can move on. Um, there's another question with a comment as well. So it says, so far we've been talking about behaviors by less dominant cultures, the effects of which are in internal to those cultures. What's your view on a dominant culture weighing in on the less dominant cultures about behaviors that affect the globe and or others outside those cultures? That comes to number four there, your culture endangers humanity. So the answer to that was yes, so does yours. So, um, and, and the example I looked to was of course COVID where everybody has turned on the wildlife markets of China, but climate change and species extinction, um, population pressures, but especially I wanna stick with climate change and species extinction as examples of problems the dominant culture has caused that are just overwhelmingly more problematic than COVID for, I mean, especially as an animal activist, we're destroying the habitat. We're just, we're taking the whole, we're, we've, we've brought earth wreck. We're taking it all down with us. So um, if you were, if you, maybe you were, you came in, you were in uh, Q and A at the other talk or something. And if you look back, I, I have answered that uh, um, in the questions, in the six questions and answers posed. Mm -hmm. At least I think I have. Okay. Um, all right, so there's one more thing. Um, that's just a comment, but I would like to share it with you. Um, it reads, I would like to thank you for being always so sensible and wonderful. I am from an unequal country and I often miss this empathic approach in the movement. It is very important to see you dissem disseminating this knowledge. So this is something thank you. I want to share. No, with you. I miss it. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's very mm -hmm. kind. And I, I really miss that too. I miss the, we lose sight of our core. I don't, it's hard to understand uh, the savageness of our, of the activist community where we've become so vicious and un, un, unfeeling. But we can change it. As I say, I have huge hope. I, I see the youngins in action and they're whipping us older folks into shape and it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so are there any more questions? Uh, is there anyone that wants to share something? I see one more person raising their hand. Hello. Hey, we can hear you. Hi, uh, my name is actually Brooke. I'm just using my partner's Zoom uh, okay. to ask this question. Hi, Brooke. Uh, hi. So my question is kind of has to do with culture. So I'm in Dubai at the moment, mm -hmm. um, but I'm actually from the U.S. But today I just had the situation where I went to a vet in Dubai because I was dropping off um, an injured bird to get help. And next to the vet, there was an area where there were um, camels and goats in enclosures. So me and my partner like went up to that area and took some footage and the animals were actually in like really bad condition. Um, and there were a couple goats that had like broken legs um, and the camels just like looked really like just not in a good condition. So I took a lot of footage and wanted to post it, but I also just didn't know how exactly I should go about that. Like when I post it, if I should also say like, this type of stuff still happens in the US and like all these other countries, or if there's just a certain way that I should word it to make sure that I'm like being sensitive to this culture. It's a perfect example. 
um, only even a stronger one because you're actually in that culture um, and you see something that you know needs to be addressed and your you know ethics are not relative you know what you're seeing it's wrong it looks like it's it looks like cruelty and cruelty is always wrong indifference to suffering is always wrong so first of all yes um, I just spent the last 20 years teaching in Montana and I assure you that veterinarians there are very interested in the profits of the cattle industry and all, you know they're not they're not concerned about cattle they oh sure they'll pamper your dog um, yes, we got the same stuff going on where, uh, you know it just in the laws in the United States. Well, I don't know if you know it in the laws of the United States, but um, animals exploited for agriculture are exempt from animal welfare. They are completely exempt. They don't, you know, especially birds and the pigeons that are used for um, experimentation. They're completely exempt. They're treated like they, they are, they may as well be inanimate objects because they are not protected. So yes, uh, the dominant culture has an extraordinarily cruel um, situation that I'm sure quite surpasses pretty much anything going on anywhere else just because of our size, our wealth, our power, um, and our ability to spread our bad habits far and wide. All right, so then what do you do? And I think it's a great time when, when you can apply that, um, what do you do? So you stay within your own culture, but oh, I'm over here, I see this, I can't just ignore it, I've got this footage find the activist there and say, hey, um, I, I, can I share something with you? Can I talk to you about something? I'm really interested. And again, approach it with sensitivity. It isn't just about us and what we're experiencing and what we have to share. So say, I might say something like, um, I'd love to learn about the topics here. I'd love to learn about what you think of our movement because it's so big and hard to avoid if you're anywhere else that you probably have some thoughts on that. And then I would say, and you know, I found this footage and I'd like to share it with you. And I don't know if it's any, I don't know what, what topics you're working on or if it's, if it's anything, but I'd like to hand that over to you if you can use it. That's how I would approach it. I would, again, as with the question asked about if you're a scholar, hand your knowledge over to the people there if they're interested, because you may, your, your information that you think is important may not be. They may have hundreds of footage of the same stuff, or that may be a small potato compared to what you know, the, some bigger issue that's behind that that they're working on. I mean, is when you're outside the culture, you don't know these things, but you can certainly get in touch with them. You can learn a ton from them if you get in touch with them and are interested in the issue. And by the way, you can then say, and I have this if you're interested. Thank you. I think that's a really good suggestion. W would you say that I also shouldn't like post it on my own Instagram? Like, would you not post that footage at all and just completely hand it over to other activists? Or like, what, ask, what are your thoughts on that? Ask the activists. They will know. They, they will know whether they believe that is more or less harmful or how they're going to feel about you if you did it or how they feel about people from dominant cultures exposing, you know, What's the balance if you do put that on? Are you going to put on then the activists and all the wonderful work they're doing? So, I mean, I, I think you can't answer that question in isolation. But I think that if you're working with activists there, um, you will find your answer to that question through them, through listening. Okay, great. Thank you. Good for you. Thanks for your activism. Uh oh, Bianca, you vanished on me. Sorry, <laughs> I'm oh, trying to yeah. mute myself. Here we go. <laughs> All right. So um, these are quite some interesting questions, uh, and there are no more. So I would officially end this part of the Q and A or the Q and A part of the discussion part for now. And I would like to once again, thank you, Lisa, so much for your presentation and for all the work you do. And thank you for doing this. Thank you, thank you, for, thank you for being here online with us. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for all your questions. My emails at the first slide. If you have anything else you want to talk about, please feel free to be in touch with me. Uh, and thank you again, Bianca, for, for doing what you're doing and all the work that all of you activists do. Thank Greatly you. appreciate it.